All right, thank you very much everyone uh, for attending this meeting. Our lecture today happens to be on introduction to data and statistics with R. So as usual, I will get to introduce myself. I am Elijah Pia from Ghana and I am an economist by profession. And indeed, I really love everything about R. That is why you always see me smiling. If you really want to reach me, that is my email right there. So this is one of the lecture series we are going to have mainly on statistics with R. We will start off with an introduction to data and statistics. And then in our next lecture, probably on Friday, we'll move on to foundations of probability with R and then eventually inferential statistics and the modeling and regression analysis. So these are the lecture series we are going to present on. And so the goal for this lesson is to introduce statistics as a science of understanding and analyzing data and making data-based decisions. Statistics as a discipline is a practice and study of collecting data and analyzing the data. And so there are two main branches of statistics. We have descriptive statistics and then inferential statistics. The descriptive statistics simply describe and summarize the characteristics of a data set. Whilst the inferential statistics will use sample data and make inferences about a larger population. It goes just beyond descriptive statistics in the sense that with inferential statistics, you can even go ahead and formulate hypothesis to assess whether the sample data is generalizable to the entire population. So that is the difference between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. When it comes to data in statistics, there are two main types. We have numeric data, which is also uh, categorized under quantitative data. And then we have categorical, which is also qualitative in nature, and so presenting this tree diagram, we get, we get to realize that data is branched into two, numeric and then categorical. And under numeric data, we have continuous and discrete data. And under categorical data, we have nominal and ordinal. So let's just take a peek at what these categories of data actually refer to. So under numeric data, we got to realize that we have two types, which, uh, which are discrete and then continuous. For, for, for discrete data, they represent finite counts, values that can just have finite count, like the number of cylinders of a vehicle, the number of students uh, attending this Zoom meeting, the number of participants of a sports competition, any data that can be counted in a finite measure is a discrete data. And then continuous data happens to be measurements within an interval. Like for instance, if we want to measure the temperature of a particular area or geographic region, we can report that the temperature is around say 50 degrees Celsius. And even between 50 degrees Celsius and 51 degrees Celsius, we can also have 50, 50.6 degrees Celsius. So we have that kind of interval between two set of values, that interval. So uh, some examples also include the height and the weight as well. Then with categorical data, we have nominal and ordinal categories. The nominal data um, represent the names and the labels and categories with no natural order. So for instance, we can have gender, we can have countries, we can have, for instance, the income groups of countries as to whether they fall within lower, middle, or high income groups. So these are the nominal categories with no natural order. But the ordinal categories, these are the names and labels with an order. So these are usually represented in Likert scales. Like for instance, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate this lecture? And also if you have a questionnaire and you wanted to test um, uh, to see how a respondent would actually give a perception about that item, you may say that, are you satisfied with the services of this hospital? And the options are very satisfied, satisfied, neutral, somewhat satisfied, not satisfied at all. So you can give that kind of uh, order to 
these uh, responses. And that is the ordinal categorical variable. So we're actually going to look at statistical exploration and summaries. And we are going to start with exploring numeric variables. And earlier on, I have explained to you what a numeric variable is all about, and the numeric data where we have a discrete and continuous, but we are going to focus much on the continuous uh, data. And so we are going to revisit this phrase that is normally used in economics and statistics, correlation does not imply causation. And so for that matter, we are just going to take into consideration two variables uh, that we want to look into. We want to explore these two variables, uh, which are numeric data and continuous in nature. And so if you want to look at the relationship that exists between two variables that are both continuous, then you would likely create a scatter diagram to look at that distribution. Now, the source of data is from the Gapminder com it's a gapminder data set and i painstakingly took time to extract information about the countries and their income per person and life expectancy in the year 2012 and in the data set the column labels are country income and life expectancy as you can see right on the screen now i would like us to practice this and visualize the relationship between these two variables. And so let's go to R. And then I have created an R script and set the working directory to the folder that contains the data set. And it is an Excel file with the extension of .xlsx. And so if you want to be able to import an Excel file, then you most likely need to use the package called read Excel. And if you look at how I have divided the sessions for the script, we have where we are going to install and load packages. And we're also going to have where we need to be importing data. And then we can just go ahead to the various themes that we have created for this lecture. And so starting off with the packages, if you do not have the read Excel package, the first thing you need to do is install it using this code, install.packages. And then in double quotes, you pass in the read Excel package. I have it installed already. And so I will just go ahead and use the library function and then pass in the name of the package, which is a read Excel, and just execute that line of code to load the package in memory. Once I have done that, I, have, I can just go ahead and I really want to name it as gapminder because it is coming from the gapminder.com. So this gapminder data set, I'm naming it as gapminder and I'm going to use the read underscore excel and then passing the name of the data set which is simply the gapminder.xlsx now this is because i have set the working directory to that particular folder that this same r script is coming from so i can just use the name of the file without going through um, the file path and all of those other things so i can just go ahead and highlight this line of code and execute so that our data is rightly imported into R. And you can see that being displayed in the environment window. And as you can see, there are 195 observations of three variables for this particular data set. So usually whenever you happen to import data into R, the first thing that you need to do is at least just look at, for instance, the first few observations of your data set. And so what I want to do is we will most likely have to use the tidyverse collection. And uh, that makes it very easy for data manipulation, especially with dplyr, which happens to be the common grammar for data manipulation. So if you don't have the tidyverse package installed, you can just go ahead and run this code and then pass in the tidyverse in double quotes. But then because I have it installed, I will just go ahead and use the library function and then pass in the tidyverse and then load that into R so I can access the functions therein. While the tidyverse is being loaded, all right, so we have all these packages that have been attached, the ggplot2 table, we have been introduced to what a tidyverse collection is all about. So at this point, I will just go ahead and type the gapminder and just go ahead and view the first six observations. So gapminder, 
and then the head of the data frame. So once I do that, you would notice that we have the first column as country, the second column as life expectancy, which is life EXP for short. And then we also have income, which actually represents the income per person, right? So once we have an idea about the column labels in this data frame, perhaps you might be interested in looking at the structure of the data frame. So I'll go ahead and say gap minder, and then look at the structure by using the str function. And I hope that you know how to pipe functions to data, just like I'm doing right here. Um, if you didn't want to use the pipe operator, you can just go ahead and type str function and pass in the name of the data frame like that. So I'm just trying to follow the tidyverse conventional way of using the pipe operator as well. So once this is done, I can just execute this and then we can have an overview or the structure of the data frame. And we get to realize that it is a table. Table is a tidy version of data frame. It's almost the same as just a data frame uh, object, all right? And so we have country, which happens to be a character variable. And it gives you the first few observations in that column. And then life expectancy that is numeric in nature and then income that is also numeric in nature. And so these are the two variables that we are going to explore their relationship. That is life expectancy and that of income. So under the section exploring numeric data, we just move ahead to the two variables where we look at a scatter plot um, to show that relationship that exists between these two variables. So using the ggplot function, we just pass in the name of the data frame, which is gapminder. And then we pass in the aesthetics. And I'm going to map income to the x-axis and then the life expectancy to the y-axis. And the geometric layer is the geom point for the scatter plot. So by highlighting these lines of code and executing, we will have our plot shown. And let me just zoom in a little bit, right? So you can observe the relationship that exists between these two variables, income and life expectancy. Now, by just looking at the scatter of the points, you can see that there happens to be some kind of a positive relationship between them in the sense that as income is increasing, then life expectancy for that country also increases. So at the end of the day, we're able to establish that there is some kind of relationship. Now, when it comes to a scatter plot, the whole idea is that usually we do have the dependent variable, assuming we were going to run maybe any form of linear regression model or whatever the case may be. Usually the dependent variable would be on the Y axis and the independent variable would be on the X axis. And so we have income on the X axis and the life expectancy on the Y axis, which is kind of giving us some intuition that perhaps income causes life expectancy, but we are not sure about that yet. We really do not know whether if the life expectancy of a particular country being as high would naturally result in higher income per person, or despite the fact that if there is a higher income for a particular country, if the income per person is higher for a country, then automatically there is uh, uh, the life expectancy of, uh, of people living in that country is going to be higher. How, we do not have any evidence to conclude that income really causes life expectancy in as much as we've been able to establish some kind of correlation, a relationship between the two. And so this is what goes behind the phrase that the fact that two variables are related doesn't mean that one causes the other, right? So that is something that we need to really explore. Now, another thing is by just looking at the relationship, we would like to know um, whether there is a linear relationship between these two variables or there is a non-linear relationship. So what we really need to do is to impose, let me just choose a theme called the theme classic. 
so that we can have this kind of view, all right, for our plots like that. Okay, and there are other things I can pass in there. Like for instance, let me just increase the size of the points to maybe twice its size. All right. Okay, so once we have this, then we would most likely to bring in a geometric layer called Geom Smooth, which is actually going to try and figure out the relationship that exists between the two variables. And so we are using the default method, which is the lowest method, that, is, that will just try to predict that trend. And so by running this code, it will pass a smooth curve between the middle of the distribution. And we can clearly see that there happens to be a non-linear relationship because we see that the way the slope of the curve, all right, it curves through the middle of the point, the line of best fit. So there seems to be that non-linear relationship between these two variables, income per person and then life expectancy. And I believe that the primary reason why this is kind of so is if you look at some of the points right here, you know, let me just take away the confidence interval around the line of best fit. And so I will just go into the geom smooth uh, function and passing the argument SE equals false, just to turn that confidence interval off. So we just have the line of best fit there. So the whole idea uh, between the relationship that exists between life expectancy and that of income is that when income of a country is increasing, then we expect the life expectancy to also increase per the line of best fit that passes through the middle of the points. So by just looking at this point, you can see that whichever that country is, has a higher income than this particular point representing whatever that country also is. And by just looking at the correlation between life expectancy and income, we've already established that the line, it is a positive slope, just that it's non-linear per the relationship, but it is a positive slope suggesting that when income is increasing, we expect life expectancy to also increase for that country. However, in as much as this country's income is higher than that of this country, the life expectancy for this country with a lower income than this one happens to be higher. And that is kind of going against the conclusion we would like to establish that when income increases, the life expectancy also increases. So I would like to label these three points to see which countries um, they are, and probably they are considered to be what we call outliers. So let's label that. So let's say above 80,000, all right? So I will just come here and then add the geom text layer. And then in the aesthetics, I'm just going to pass the country variable, the country column to the label aesthetic. Now, if I should just run this entire line of code, it is going to label all the points. Which actually, we are missing out a, a, a number of, um, of details, okay? But I just wanted to label these three points, Singapore, Luxembourg, and then Qatar. So I just have to find a way of clearing all these labels. And so what I'm going to do is I need to pass the data argument inside of the geom test function and then grab the gap minder. So let me put this one down like this. So we have a fresh um, line. So the data argument we set to the gap minder, but we need to filter this data. And so using the pipe operator, I am going to filter this data where income is greater than 80,000. 
So I am filtering this data where income is greater than 80,000. Let us pass this into the console and see what is going to happen. And you can see that the countries, Luxembourg, Qatar, and Singapore are those countries with income levels of above 80,000. And so when we pass that to the data argument, then we will only be able to grab those countries that are in this filtered data, and that will label our plots right there nicely for us. So by executing this line of code, we are then able to label these three countries where we realize that Singapore happens to have a lower income level than Qatar. However, the life expectancy for Singapore is still higher than Qatar. I think Qatar has a very high income because I know that countries will have uh, discovered uh, oil. Luxembourg, I cannot say much. But you can also see that for Luxembourg, it also has the highest income so far among all the countries that are represented in this group. However, the life expectancy is still lower than that of Singapore with a lower income. So just by going ahead and concluding that when income increases, the life expectancy of a country is expected to also increase, uh, might be wrong for these outliers. Now, one of the things that we usually observe in the correlation between two numeric variables is that whenever we are able to identify outliers, like for instance, we may be influenced to try and take away Singapore, Luxembourg, and Qatar, because these are the outliers right there. That is one of the ways we deal with outliers, just to remove them. But you can see that because we are trying to compare the life expectancy and income per person of all countries in the world, then we most likely need to retain all of them because they are very necessary uh, in this kind of relationship. Because just by taking away Qatar, Singapore, and Luxembourg, it means that we'll just be in the blind for what life expectancy, what relationship they have when it comes to their income levels and life expectancy. So the next thing that you need to do is, after having established the relationship and identifying the outliers which are deemed important to be part of the scatter, you will need to now take the income variable and explore that separately and look at the distribution of income. And you would also have to take the life expectancy and also look at its own distribution. So at this point, I would like us to go back to the slides. And having explored the relationship between the two variables, income and life expectancy, if we are pulling it down to try to look at the distribution of those variables separately, then it comes to exploring the numeric data, one variable. And if it's one variable and it's discrete in nature, then probably a bar plot would deem fit to look at uh, the distribution. However, income and life expectancy was seen to be continuous in nature. And so to be able to look at the distribution of each of these variables, then we just have to look at the following plots, a geom histogram, geom density, geom dot plot, and then geom box plot. So before we just happen to look at the distribution of each variable, I would just like us to introduce ourselves to the distribution of data when it comes to using the histogram, because the histogram is the most common kind of plot to show the distribution of a continuous numeric variable. If you explore a continuous numeric variable and you find out that the data is piled up to the right, like the first scenario, the data is piled up to the right, then this is known as a left skewed distribution. And how are we able to determine that this is truly left skewed? So I'm just going to superimpose um, the density on it. So you can see that the tail is on the left-hand side of the distribution. And for that matter, this is why we simply refer to this one as less skew. 
So if you see the data pad up to the right, then the tail is to the left, and that makes it a left skewed distribution. But the moment you see that your curve, all right, is not piled up to the left or right, then it is symmetric. In, in, it's a symmetric distribution. And that is what we refer to as the normal bell curve or a normal distribution. It's only that if it has the mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, then we call it a standard normal distribution. So any distribution that is symmetric is a normal distribution. But if the mean of the variable you are, being, you are observing for that normal distribution has a, has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, then it is a standard normal distribution. If the data is piled up to the left, it means that the tail pushes itself to the right, and that also makes it a right skewed distribution. So having observed this distribution of data, then we most likely want to go back into R and then explore each variable using the histogram. And so we just raise our ggplot function and pass in our gapminder data set. And then with the aesthetics, we pass, let us start with the income. And then add the layer geom histogram to look at the distribution of the income variable. And so by running this line of code, we're able to determine the distribution of the income per person variable. And then you have seen that the data is piled up to the left. And so it is most likely if you had imposed a density um, plot over it, then you notice that that is a rice skewed uh, data. So we have some countries, probably these are the countries, Singapore, uh, Qatar, and then Luxembourg, which are the outliers. So you can see that these three observations have been uh, separated, isolated from the rest of the, <clears throat> of the data. Now, normally when it comes to a histogram, what really happens is the histogram will try and group the data into intervals. Like for instance, maybe zero to 10,000, 10,000 to 20,000, 20,000 to 30,000, and try to create bars to represent the number of values that fall within those intervals. And so that is how we're able to see uh, those bars over there. If I really want to make the boundaries of the bars visible, then I will most likely have to pass in an aesthetic, but not inside the AES function, but outside. So I'll just go ahead and pass the color to black. So we can see clearly the outlines and know the boundaries of the bars. Okay, I think the color, so let me just choose a blue color. Sorry, I think I am rather passing it into, hold on. So I need to pass it into the geom histogram like that. Because X inside the aesthetic function, this is the entire aesthetic function. And then by passing it outside like I was doing, uh, it means it just got confused as to what you really wanted to do. So nothing really happened. So I think what I need to do is to pass into the geom histogram without the AES function and pass the color, let's do it back to black. So black, and if you should run it, you're able to determine the boundaries. Yeah. So you can see how the bars are binned into those intervals. And then the bars representing the proportion of values that fall within those intervals. So what we can make out of this distribution is that it is right skewed with some outliers with very high income levels. So having done this, we also need to explore that of the life expectancy. So ggplot and I pass in the data argument to the gapminder data set. And then the aesthetics, I will pass the life expectancy to the X axis and also create a histogram plot. And so we just simply add the layer geom histogram. And let me pass the color to black so we can also see the boundaries of the, of the bars.
So what do you think we can also say about this kind of distribution? I think it is also left skewed with some outliers as well. Right? So if we were imposing the density plot, then it would have been a left skewed distribution. However, just by looking at the distribution, it's not just enough. When we get to the measures of central tendencies, we'll just try to look at how these measures actually relate when it comes to um, distributions. So we've just noticed that in the, so let me just go back here. We have just noticed that when visualizing the income alone, it is that the distribution is not normal. It is right skewed, even with some out, outliers. And then by also looking at the distribution of the life expectancy, we also get to observe that it's also left skewed. And there are also some values that are isolating it uh, themselves from the entire distribution of data. So there are also outliers in here. And so that would explain the reason why when we explore the relationship between the two variables, we notice that one country so far has the highest income, yet it had a, life, a lower life expectancy than a country with a lower income level. So let's go back to the slide. And then whenever you are also looking into the distribution of numeric, single numeric uh, variables, then the beam width will also determine the appearance of your histogram. Like for instance, if you have a very large beam width, as is the case for the left graph, then I think we'll be missing out on, we'll be losing a lot of information right there to be able to ascertain the, the true distribution of, of the data for that particular variable. And if the beams are also too narrow, then perhaps the bars may just be too overwhelming for us to actually deduce anything. And so you will just need to play with the beams to decide on how your uh, histogram representing the distribution of the data should look like. And so when we were in R, we got to realize that by creating the plot, it uses a default beams of 30. And so it is even asking whether you wanted to pick a better value with a beam width. So maybe why don't we just try it out and see what is going to happen? So we are looking at the distribution of income once more. And at this point, we are just going to pass in the beam width argument and perhaps set it to two and let's see what is going to happen. So the beam width will just depend on you as the data analyst. And you just have to be playing with it. So you are able to get the distribution of the data that you feel you can speak to, you can speak about that, that data distribution. By choosing a beam width of two, I think it is taking too long to load the plots. So I really don't know what is happening there. Why don't I change you to five and see? And so, like I said, it's up to you to be playing around these beams. Okay, what if I make it 30? Would that be too much? Because I'm talking about the width of the, of the beams. All right, so error in grid call graphics, output mixed. Hmm. Or is the beam we're supposed to be passed into the Aesthetic function, I am not really sure, but let's try that one and see. So being with, okay, there is no even, there is no suggestion right there. So I think it has to be outside of that. So being with, let's set it to 10. Okay, so perhaps the data is just too overwhelming to try and pick up this being with kind of thing. But then, um, so sometimes the old works, to, yeah. Pardon? The, the old works. All right, all right. It, it works on your end, at your end, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe I don't know whether um, it has to do with my RAM 
perhaps uh, I, I really don't know, but it is very slow at my end. So I would like to go back to the base graphic to do that. And to be able to do that, I have to use the hist function and grab the gap minder data set followed by the dollar symbol and grab the income and then just plot it. Yeah, I think so. The base graphic is really fast and I need to check why um, my, my machine was slow to responding to the code I was running with the beam width. And so, for instance, if I happen to choose um, the beam width argument in the ggplot, inside the base graph his function, it is rather bricks. So bricks of 30, and let's find out and see. All right. What if I made it 50? Okay. So you can see that you can now be um, playing with the beams, the beams, the, the, the number of beams that you need to pass for your histogram distribution and play with it to see which one that uh, fits best in your, in your case, right? So if I had used 25, I think this is just even enough or the default beam width was just okay, all right? So you just need to be playing with it. And so the way your distribution of data looks like depends on the beam width, like I said. So you need to be playing around to be able to get that um, a moderate kind of beam width. You can really speak about that uh, data distribution. So another way of also visualizing numeric data is by using a dot plot. So now what a dot plot really does is it takes each individual value in, in your data and tries to stack points to show um, the proportion of, uh, of, of that value in the distribution, right? And so if your sample size is very large, the dot plot will not be re re really be feasible because it might be too overwhelming for the plot and you miss out on the details. So if I should go to the R to look at the dot plots, then probably I would have my GG plots and then pass in the gap minder data set. And then with the statics, let me pass in to it, the income. And then we have the zoom dot plot. And so by running this, let's see what really happens. Well, so it tries to take each individual value in your data and then tries to stack points to represent the proportion of, of that data. So instead of the histogram, which uses the beans for that interval, it uses the, 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 the dots or the points. That is why they named it the dot plot. So this is for income. And if I had done it for, The life expectancy yep then we would also have an idea about the distribution of this particular variable now when we explore each variable using the histogram there is one kind of plot that is referred to as a density plot which is just the kind of line that also shows the distribution as to whether it is right skewed, left skewed, or symmetric. And so we'll just use the same kind of code, ggplot, and then we pass our gap minder to the data argument. And then inside the aesthetics, I will just pass the income, starting with that. And then I would use the geometric layer called geom density. And then by running that, we are able to decipher that it is possibly right skewed. And if we had done the same for the life expectancy, then we have the geom density. So a density plot will also look at the distribution of life expectancy in a gap minder data frame. And 
we've also realized that this is also left skewed. The next visualization for exploring single numeric variable is the box plot. The box plot can also give an idea about the distribution of the variable. And so we're able to distinguish between the left skew distribution, right skew distribution, and then a normal or symmetric distribution. <clears throat> and so just by superimposing the density plot on the box plot, we're able to determine that if you look at the median, the middle thick line, um, the line in the middle of the box, which is thick black line. And so it really shows you that this kind of um, variable with this sort of distribution is a normal distribution or symmetric. But if you look at the left skew, you can see that the data is also piled up, the box there, it's also piled up to the right. And so for that matter, we can see that this is also left skewed. And then the right skewed box plot there also gives you an idea about where the data is mostly piled up to the left and with an elongated tail on the right. So that is also right skewed distribution. So let's go back to R to practice that and see how we'll be able to use the box plot to also establish the distribution of each variable right there. So we go ahead and use the ggplot function and then we pass the gap minder data set and then grab one of the first variables which is income. And then we simply go ahead and add the geometric layer called box plots. So geom box plot, and then run this line of code. And then you can see that the data is piled up to the left with a lot of values falling between zero and $30,000. And so this data also, um, this kind of visualization also tells us that the distribution is right skewed. If we should do that for the life expectancy, so geom box plot, and then plot this as well, oops, the variable exp, all right, like that. And then you would also notice that most of the data values are piled up to the right, and that also shows a left skewed distribution. So let's go back to the slide and then move on. So this is what statistics is all about. Now let's look at the concept of population versus sample. Now, anytime we refer to population in statistics, we are referring to the entire group that you want to draw conclusions about. Like for instance, if we're looking at income of all countries in the world, there are about 195 countries in the world. I think with 193 part of the United Nations, two are yet to be fully recognized as countries. That is a Palestine and one other country, I've really forgotten about that. But in total, there are 195 countries in the world. And so if I wanted to look at the income and life expectancy, the relationship that exists between these two variables for all the countries, then I would be looking into the relationship considering the entire population. But oftentimes it is not easy for you to get data on the entire population. Like for instance, um, I happen to have my master's at the University of Education, Winneba. And so if I were interested in looking at the <clears throat> the average performance of economic students uh, in UUW at the undergraduate level, then I might as well um, grab the performance of these students from level 100 through level 400. But perhaps if I even consider a time frame like one week in collecting my data, let's say I was going to each student and trying to figure out what their performance is uh, per the courses that they're offering. Uh, perhaps some of the students might not even be present due to some extra, um, um, uh, maybe they might happen to be on extracurricular activities. There might be some extraneous variables that are affecting the attendance. And I might not be able to, even the time and the cost involved, be able to grab the entire student population from level 100 through 400 and be able to report on the average performance. So in order to save time and cost, I most probably would have to use a sample. So I just grab, for instance, 50 students each from, for, from each level. Um, from level 100 through 400, that makes it 200, and that becomes my sample. 
So those represent the specific group from the population I'm going to use for the inference. And so once I'm able to grab that 200 um, students and take their performance in the various courses in the economics department, and I'm able to arrive at a center, like for instance, maybe the average is 60%, then I will use that sample to make generalization about the population. Because whenever you are reporting in statistics, you most not likely be saying that the average performance of 200 economic students, no, nope. but when I go out there, I'll probably say that the average performance of UEW economic students, because I generalize it to the entire population. And so with this example I've cited on the screen, the income of all countries in the world would be the population. And if I should scoop the income of countries in Africa, if I wanted to look at the income of countries in Africa alone, then probably that is going to be the sample from the population. So that is the difference between population and that of sample in statistics. So we just look at what we refer to as the measures of central tendency or the measures of center. Now, sometimes it will not be too good for us to have all observations for the data. So we try to get estimate. It's usually always the time not easy for us to grab entire population for studies. And so we grab these samples and then work with, with, with it. Now, anytime we're able to figure out an estimate from this particular sample, it may not be perfect, but as long as it is a good sample, and what makes a good sample? A sample that is representative of the population. And there are numerous sampling techniques that are used with statisticians reporting on which sampling techniques are best and which are not. And so all we are just trying to say is that if we're able to sample really well, and that is actually representative of the population, then it will make these estimates that we are generating good guesses of the population. And so the measures of central tendency, they describe the key characteristics of a distribution. Remember initially we started with a scatter plot and then we were able to examine the relationship between life expectancy and that of the income, all right? But when we noticed that there were some outliers affecting the way um, our conclusion would have been in terms of higher income leads to higher life expectancy, and then we narrowed it down to each variable when looking into their distributions, there are these measures of center which will describe the characteristics of a distribution. So maybe we might want to look at the average income for the countries and maybe the average life expectancy, yes. And so if you want to describe these measures of centers, then the three common measures of centers are mean, mode, median. Now, if you are working with the entire population and then you happen to find the mean, now the mean becomes a population parameter. But if you were not able to grab the entire population for your statistical analysis and you work with sample, then the mean becomes a sample statistic. And 99% of the time, researchers, statisticians, data analysts, data scientists work with samples. And so we are only trying to generate what we call sample statistics. So the mean mode median, when we are working with sample, they are just simply referred to as sample statistics. So here I am not taking uh, the time to go into their Greek representations, like for instance, with a the mean as a population parameter is, 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 is represented in Greek letter by the mu um, Greek letter. Um, that is not what we are going to look at because we are now looking at an applied statistics kind of thing that we are doing in R. So we, I believe we all have an idea about what the mean mode median and those computations by hand all does. But today um, we use software for everything. So we just go ahead and do what we have to do. So if you wanted to calculate the mean of a variable in, in, in a data frame, then we use the mean function in R. If you wanted to calculate the median, then we use the median function. And if you really wanted to know the mode, then these are the two functions that you can count on. The table function, which will try to grab each value in your distribution and report the number of times those values appeared. And then the count in deep prior, which also do the same for you. But when it comes to measures of central tendency, the mode is not a better measure of center. 
So usually statisticians and data analysts depend on the mean and the median for such computations. However, we'll just look at how all these three are calculated and the reason why the mode will not be a better measure. So let's go into R and practice what we've just said, the measures of central tendencies, the mean mode and that of the median. So by using the table function, so let's say we are grabbing the mean, so uh, the mode, sorry. So with the mode, I'm just going to say the table and then I will grab the gap minded data and then simply take the life expectancy and by running this, hmm, it is giving us some kind of output that we are not really expecting. It is just trying to take each value in the variable and then give us the counts of the number of times they appear. Like for instance, 47.9 appears only once in the entire data frame, but 57.4 appears twice. So this is really not feasible when you are dealing with numeric uh, data, all right? If you wanted to really look at the mode, it would fit for discrete variables or categorical variables. That would work really fine. And so for a numeric continuous distribution, the mode is not a better measure of the center. And so we just go ahead and avoid it. However, if we're using the dply r count function that we showed, we showed in the slide, then that would have been the gap minder. And then I pipe with the count function. And what do I want to count? Let's say the life expectancy. And if I should, the gap minder is spelled wrongly. So let me just correct it. And if I should just run this, it is able to give us the count of each value in the life expectancy uh, variable. But we've already established that the mode is not a better, uh, let, let me just put it this way, it's not a good measure of center for numeric variables. So we go ahead with the mean. And if you want to compute the mean, we use the mean function. And then we pass into it a variable for which we want to find the mean. And so I'll just go ahead and write the gap minder followed by the dollar symbol. And then for instance, start with income. So by running this line of code, we're able to establish that the mean income per person across all countries on average is 18,755 US dollars for the year 2012. Actually the data is 2012 data. Now, if you feel that using the base um, function, uh, it's really not appealing in its output, then you can most likely uh, rely on dply out to give you a very good result. And so what we are going to do is grab the gap minder data frame and then pipe to the summarize verb. And then let's name it as average income equals the mean of income from, from the data frame. So the mean of income from the gap minder data frame, but I'm summarizing and giving it the name average income. And if I should run this line of code, we're able to get a very good uh, table data frame of the average income. If I also wanted to do the same for the life expectancy, then from the base, our perspective, it would have been the mean, and then the gap minder, followed by the life expectancy, run that, you're able to get 7 to 1, 1.18. So um, that is approximately the average life expectancy across all countries is 71 years of age. If I should pipe it using the dply R in the same summarize verb, then I can say the average life EXP equals the mean of life expectancy. And by running this line of code, we're able to notice the average income as $18,755 per person. And then on average, life expectancy is also 71 years of age for all countries. 
So if we also wanted to calculate the median, then we'll use the median function, but this time around, let us rely on dplyr to do that work for us. And so gapminder data frame, and then I pipe the summarized verb to that. And then I'm just going to say median income equals the median function and I pass in the income. And then when done, I'm going to say um, median life expectancy, life EXP equals the median of life expectancy. And so by running this code, we're able to establish that the median income across all countries is around 11,200 US dollars per person. And then the median life expectancy is 73 years of age. Now let's go back to the slide and figure out what exactly to do next when it comes to the measures of center. I think so far that is all that we needed to do, the mean, the median, and the mode. These are the measures of center. Later on, we are going to talk about which of these uh, measures are robust, right? Which are better in terms of um, trying to figure out the key characteristics of the center or the center of a distribution. So another concept in statistics is the measures of spread. And the measures of spread also describe the variability of data, right? How spread the data is from one another. And if you look onto the screen, you would most likely see that the dashed um, density curve uh, has a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And I plotted the same thing in R with a mean of zero, uh, but with a standard deviation of two. And you will notice that the, the, the density curve with the standard deviation of two is much more dampened and then spread out than the one with the standard deviation of one. And so this is what we are just trying to. So we can say that the one with a standard deviation of two varies greatly from each other than the one with a standard deviation of one. And so the measures of spread also describes how data is far off from each other. And perhaps that might also give us insight into some of these uh, outliers that we're experiencing uh, in the relationship we explored in the scatter plot. So these are the common measures of spread. We have the range, which is simply the difference between the maximum and the minimum values. And then the variance is the average square deviation from the mean. So all you have to do with the variance is simply take the difference between each value in the variable from its mean. But by summing those values, you simply get zero. And so that is not meaningful for any kind of statistical analysis. And so we square these deviations and when you do that and you get your result, it is reported in the square of the variable. Like for instance, if we're calculating the variance of income, whatever value, whatever value that you get in describing the variability of the data, you can see that the data varies by each other, that value of income squared. But it is not um, really good if we are interpreting uh, um, our income values of the, of the evolving the spread in, in, in square values. Right, so we would have to use values that are down to um, the, the weight assigned to, to the data. The standard deviation is also another measure, which is simply the average deviation around the mean. And it's also found by uh, taking the, um, the sum of the difference between the value and its mean. And, or simply, let's just say it is the square root of the variance. All right, it's the square root of the variance. So we divide by the sample size n minus one if you are dealing with a sample. Okay. So like I said, the details of how these are computed by hand and these formulas and those things, um, we'll leave it to uh, maybe start pure statistics like, but this time around we do everything with software. And we also have the interquartile range, which is the range of the middle 50% of the distribution, right? And it's simply the difference between the first and third quartiles. And so if you wanted to calculate the range, now you can use the max function to find the maximum value in the data and the mean function to find the minimum value in the data and then take the difference you're able to get the range. So it's simply the difference between the lowest and the highest points uh, of, of, of the data. There is also a range function, but it does not give you the difference between the maximum and minimum. However, it gives you the minimum and the maximum values. 
And so once you're able to identify the minimum and maximum values, then you can go ahead and take the, the difference and be able to determine the range as per statistics. So this range function in R will only retain the minimum and the maximum values for you. And we are going to demonstrate that uh, in R. If you want to calculate the variance, then use the var function. If you wanted to calculate the standard deviation, you simply use the sd function. And you can also take the square root using the sqrt function and then pass in the variance to also get the standard deviation as well. And if you really wanted to calculate the interquartile range, so you have to divide your data into quartiles. So uh, 0, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. And then you, you would have to use the quantile function to do that. And another visualization that is able to give you the distribution of the data in terms of the quartiles and all those sort of things is the box plot. We're also going to demonstrate it for all of them. So at this point, we'll just go into R and then really find out how to compute these values, the measures of spread. So like it was said before, the measures of spread will just describe how the data varies from each other or the spread of the data, okay? And so how do we compute the range? If we are grabbing income, for instance, then we most likely will be able to do so by saying, uh, let's grab the gap minder. If I were using dply r, then I will find the range of income. And so by running this, oops, income not found. Hmm. So maybe the range is not really working with the pipe. And so I will just take this one off and take the function as it is, and then use my data frame and chain it to the variable I'm looking for. So gapminder dollar symbol income and find the range and we're able to get that the lowest income value is $863 per person and the highest value is 112,000. This is truly far from each other. So if I wanted to really calculate the range, then I can save this, which appears to be a vector 863 and 112,000. Let's save it as values. Let's just simply call it values. And then I will just go ahead and say values and grab the first value minus, the first value happens to be the, the minimum value. And I do not want to get negative value for the range. And so I'll grab the second value and then take the values again, and then grab the first value. And so by running this line of code, we're able to values not found. Oops, okay, I use a uppercase V, it is a lowercase V. And so if I do that and run, I'm able to get the difference between the minimum and maximum values to be 111,137. Now the range is a poor measure of spread because it is just taking the difference between the lowest and the highest point in the data. And that really doesn't speak so much about the range because if there are liars, it will be very difficult to speak about how spread these data is. If you really also wanted to calculate the range, you could have set the maximum of gap minder followed by the dollar sign income, and then minus the minimum function, so the mean function, gap minder, income, and by running that, we're able to get 111,000, just like we had uh, for the range. Now, because I am in love with the tidyverse collection, I always want to try and see whether I can replicate the same kind of thing using um, the dply r. If I do that, I'm not able to get that of income, even if I chain it. Hmm. But unless, of course, I grab this variable, if I wanted to use the pipe operator and then use the dollar symbol like this, and if I run this, of course, I'm going to get a result. Okay. If that is what I really wanted to do, then I have to take the gap minder followed by the dollar sign income and then chain it to the minimum function. 
like that. And so I'll be able to get a difference as 111,137. Okay. So which means that it will still have worked with the range if I had taken this one out and then simply chain it to the range function and I'll be able to get a result with the lowest value and the highest value. So this is how you compute the range as a measure of spread. Now with the variance, we simply use the var function. And so in that case, I'm going to use the gap minder and then chain with a summarized verb. And then I would say that the variance let me call it the variance income is the var function and a passing income. And then the variance of life expectancy. <clears throat> and let me just simply say it is the variance of life expectancy. And by running this result, we're able to get that the variance for the income is 388 million. 64,413 income per person squared. And that means we have squared each value in our data by generating the variance to describe the spread. So these are all in square terms. And like, for instance, the variance of the life expectancy is also 64 years squared. But it will not pay for us to be reporting um, values in the square terms of our variable. So we have to bring it down to the same unit and for that matter, we use the standard deviation. So I'll grab the same code. And then change the var function to the SD function to calculate the standard deviation. And so let me change the variance right here to SD for income and this one as the for life expectancy. And by running this, now we're able to say that how far our data is spread from each other um, is by, so let's say how far our data deviates from each other is approximately 20,000 US dollars uh, per person. And then um, the countries with their life expectancies varies by uh, eight years, standard deviation of eight years units. So these are being brought down to the units of what we actually contain in the original data, not something like variance, which is um, in, in reported in the, in the variable square, in the squared unit of, of those variables. Now, when it comes to the interquartile range, we can compute that using the IQR function the IKLR function, because it is simply the difference between the third quartile and then the, the first quartile. However, even using the IKLR function, we can use the quantile function as it was said before, because the quantile would divide the data into, into quartiles. And so let's try that and see. So I will take the gap minder data frame and then select the income variable and chain it to the quantile function like that and run. And so the 0% here represents the minimum value in the data. So the minimum income value is 863 US dollars. The 25% of the distribution, okay, that is the first quartile is 3,875. The 50% happens to be the median value that is 11,200 as we had before. The third quartile, which happens to be the 75th percentile of the distribution is 25,700 US dollars. And then the maximum value is 100% of the distribution and that is 112,000. So we can see that we need to just find the difference between the 25th distribution and that of the uh, 75th um, quartile, uh, the third quartile. So the third quartile and then minus the first quartile, we're able to get the interquartile range. 
So how are we able to do this sort of thing? Now, if I were using the quantile this way, the gap minder, and then by grabbing the income variable, and then I wanted to check what class it belongs to. It is a numeric class, but do I know it is a vector? So if I had saved this one into say quartiles, and then I say quartiles and I'm grabbing the first value, let's see if that is going to work like that. And that is the 0% of the distribution. So if I use two indexes at two, then I have the first quartile, which is 25% of the distribution. So this value $3,875 per person lies at the 25th uh, percent of the distribution. So that means I can just go ahead and say four, and then the quartiles two, and then I'm able to get the interquartile range. And because the four counts first, that is why it's actually reporting the 75th. Is that the case? If I were bringing out the quartiles, that is 25,700. And if I'm bringing out the, the first quartile, that is 3,875. And so the difference between the two is simply going to be 21,825. By going through this process, maybe we are stressing ourselves too much. We simply use the I kill R function. Hmm, there was no suggestion. Am I missing out on this function? Okay, let's find out. So gap minder and then income. And by running it, of course, we're able to get the interquartile range to be $21,825. Uh, so for the measures of spread, we've looked at range, variance, standard deviation, and interquartile range. So far, we've done that for only income. So you can also do the same for life expectancy. These are ways you were able to describe the characteristics of the data in terms of spread. And then we did that for the measures of center as well. All right, yeah, there is a question like that. Yeah, before looking for the median, don't you saw the data first? Absolutely. Um, if we were dealing with, um, in fact, the, the, I think the number of observations are 195. If we're using small sample size, we would have been able to decipher which exactly is the middle one. Yes, of course, the median function actually sorts the data and then returns the middle uh, 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 value in the distribution for the median, okay? So instead of, for instance, just by digressing a little bit, by going to the measures of center and the median, if we had cooked our own data, X for instance, and then we had given the value like three, six, eight, two, four, nine, and 12, one, and four, Then the X values are reported this way. And if I were to sort this data, then I would have used the sort function to sort the data in increasing in ascending order. And then try to figure out what number lies at the middle or is the midpoint. And so this is the first three. This would be the first three. Okay, so the median is going to be four. And so if I go ahead and the median of X, I get the result as four. But the median does it all for you. It sorts the data in ascending order and then computes the midpoint for you. Now, because the number of values here are odd, it's odd, then um, it only grabs the, the middle value at the center of the distribution. But if it were even and there were two values, then it would have taken the average of those two values uh, the midpoint of those two values, and that would have been the median. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Now, when we say statistics is robust or robust statistics, we are talking about 
the kind of measure that is least affected by stream values. So just like the relationship between the income and life expectancy, we got to realize that there were some outliers. So probably if you were computing the mean, the median, and those measures of center and spread, they will be affected. But how I will be able to figure those things out? So let's take it for instance that we were looking at the robust measures of center, the mean and median. We've already established that the mode would fit for discrete variables, so we've taken it out. So we are just looking at the mean and the median as describing the center of a numeric continuous uh, data distribution. So if you had the values one, two, three, four, five, six, then by calculating the mean, you get 3.5 and the median is 3.5. But if you change the number six, the last value from six to thousand, for instance, you'll notice that the median still stays at 3.5, but the mean is 169.12 which means that between the mean and the median, the mean is more sensitive to outliers than the median. So between mean and median, we will, it is better we say that the median is robust to outliers or it's a more robust statistic than the mean. That is why, for instance, if, if you've seen data scientists actually looking into housing um, prices of, of areas, there is one project I worked on um, when I was taking a particular course with the World Grant University also. Uh, when we were looking into the projects, uh, housing prices in the United States or so, somewhere in the United States, usually whenever they wanted to describe the, the center of the housing prices, they would use the median housing income, the median housing price. Why? Because there are certain areas with very, um, um, uh, with housing prices that are very costly, than some areas which are very low housing prices. And for that matter, by using the mean as a measure of center, you would only be weighing the mean towards the, uh, the mean will be affected by the outlier, all right, by large values. And so the mean will not be a better measure of, of the center of a distribution concerning housing prices, all right? So the mean is very sensitive to outliers. We will establish when to use the mean and when to use the median in no time. So, by passing a note, while the mean depends on all observations, the median depends only on the midpoint of the distribution and the values of the endpoints are irrelevant to its calculation. So this is all just to say that the median is robust to uh, even outliers. But the mean, because it depends on the entire observations, no matter how big the values are, it will just take the average by considering all these observations and that makes the mean sensitive to outliers. And so you see that the mean value will be very much inflated if there are outliers or very extreme values in your distribution of data. So by looking at the example we've illustrated earlier, we've got to realize that the median is a more robust statistic uh, in terms of measuring the center than the mean. So when it comes to the measures of spread, if you just try and also um, experiment with the code and try to look at how the values are, computed for the measures of spread, we also realize that the IQL, the interquartile range, if you notice the distribution, it has to do with computation based on the median. And so it will probably also be more robust than the standard deviation, which also has to do with the mean, because the standard deviation is the average. Once the mean comes in, the average of the square deviations, okay, the square root of the variance and all those sort of things. So definitely the interquartile range, which is a computation based on the median, will be more robust to extreme values than the standard deviation because the standard deviation is calculated using the mean or using an average uh, principle. So robust statistics like the median for the measure of center and the interquartile range for the measure of spread are most useful for describing skewed distributions. So when your data is skewed, then the best measure of center is median and the best measure of spread is the interquartile range. But non-robust statistics like the mean and standard deviation are very useful for describing symmetric data. So if your data follows a normal distribution or is normal in any way or symmetric in any way, then the mean will not be a very good measure for the center and the standard deviation will be a good measure for the spread. So before we move on to the data transformation, there are some experiments I want us to con conduct in R to see um, how median becomes more robust to some of these outliers. So let's go back to R and then find out 
all that we are just trying to talk about. So it, it doesn't become um, just by word of mouth only. So what I'm going to do right now is we have already established that income was right skewed and then life expectancy was left skewed. So these are skewed distributions. So as far as the gap minder uh, data frame is concerned where we have life expectancy and income, skewed distributions, the better robust statistics to, uh, for, for the measure of center should be the median and that of the spread should be the interquartile range. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to generate um, some imaginary data using a normal distribution. And so let me simply call it DF, just anything else. DF, and I'm going to use the rnorm function, and I'm going to generate 500 sample size with a mean of 20 and a standard deviation of five. So I'm just generating some fictitious data, um, a random normal distribution using the rnorm function. And then the first argument is the sample size you want to generate. So I'm generating 500 sample size and then the mean and the standard deviation. Now the mean is zero by default and the standard deviation is five by default. i uh, sorry, it's one by default. And that is a standard normal distribution, all right? But I'm just giving it the mean of 20 and the standard deviation of five. So by running this and then looking into the histogram of this data that we have generated, now we're able to establish that this is a normal distribution with a mean of 20 and a standard deviation of five. So as long as it is a normal distribution, you know what is going to happen? I want to impose the median and the mean all on the same graph. So you would observe exactly what really happens when the data is normally distributed. So I will use the AB line function. And there is an argument called V, which is representing the vertical line. And so I'm going to superimpose the mean of DF that I've created. And then let me give it a color of red. And then I will also superimpose again using the AB line, a vertical line, which happens to be the median of DF and then the color as blue. And so let me rerun the histogram, then the AB line, and then that of, so let me just make the line width twice its size. It looks too thin, and then the line width twice the size. So, so we have the histogram. Then let me run this code again. The mean, that is a red line. And then the median, that's the blue line. So you can see that the mean and the median are the same. And for some data which are almost normally distributed, the mean and the median will be very approximate. They will be very, very close. But here you can see that the mean and the median, um, when we impose the, the, the mean line as red and the blue line, you can see that the blue line for the median is overshadowing that of the mean, which shows you that for a normally distributed data, the mean and median are approximate. And so if you are describing data that is normally distributed, the mean is a very good measure of center. All right. So at that point in time, we just stick to the mean because it is good to report uh, uh, income values and those things on averages than, than the median and those, other, those sort of things. But when it happens, it's a skew distribution, and then we are going to encounter some of these issues. So what I'm going to do right now is let me just use the same um, uh, base R function, hist, grab the gap manda uh, data set, and then grab the income, which we know to be right skewed, all right? And then I am also going to grab these two lines of code, the AB line, but this time around, change this one to gap minder income, and this one to gap minder income. So the mean is the red line, and then the blue line is the median value. And so by plotting, the mean, you can see where the red line is. And then by also plotting the vertical line for the median, you can also see where the median value is. So because the data is right skewed, all right, where the large values are to the right, you can see that the mean being sensitive to these outliers is pulled towards the skew. 
but the median remains at the center of the distribution. The median is always that middle value for which 50% of the distribution lies below it and 50% lies above it. And so if you have a skewed distribution, the median will still stay in the middle of the data distribution. However, the mean being sensitive to outliers will be pulled towards the skewed uh, distribution or be pulled towards the outlier. So for a skewed distribution, the median will be a robust statistic to measure the center than the mean. So for a right skewed distribution, the mean is greater than that of the median because the mean will be pulled towards the skew. But if we're doing the same thing for that of the life expectancy, so by changing this one to life expectancy, then by looking at the distribution of life expectancy, we also see that this is also um, left skewed. And for that matter, by imposing the mean with a red line, and that of the median, you can see that the mean also is pulled towards the left skew distribution. And so for a skew distribution, the median will be a better measure um, of center. But for symmetric distribution, the mean is just okay. Okay, so when it comes to transforming data, it means that you are rescaling the data according to using a particular function. And why do you have to scale data? Like for instance, when we um, actually uh, created a scatter plot between the life expectancy and that of the income, we noticed that it was an upper sloping curve, but some kind of a nonlinear relationship. So if we were to perform a log logarithm on one of the variables, what would have happened? That is something that we just need to look at. So at that point in time, just by going into R, I will go ahead and revisit the code. So ggplot and I pass in the data equals the gap minder. So give me just a few minutes and we are wrapping up. And then the aesthetics, I will just go ahead and then uh, place my income on the X axis and then the life expectancy on the Y axis, create a geom point. And then fit a line through the middle of the points. And so by running this, we're able to see that the line shows a nonlinear relationship between life expectancy and income. And so we are not, we were not able to establish a conclusion that with higher income, your life expectancy is also higher as well. So how are we able to, um, let's say income, which happens to be the larger values, if we were to log transform that income value, then what would have happened? So in the aesthetic attribute, I would just use the log function around the income variable. There are two ways you can do that by just wrapping the, the variable you've mapped to the exercise, the income in the log function. Or you could have used any of the scales that are available in ggplot2. ggplot2 is just there for you to uh, do all those sort of things. So like after the jump smooth, you would have said scale my x axis uh, to a log. So far, it's the common log that is available. So even by using the common logarithm and the log function itself without the 10 happens to be the natural logarithm. And most probably we use the natural logarithm though, but the common log will serve a similar purpose. So let's find out what really happens when we take the log of income against life expectancy. So by running this line of code, Good, you can see that by log transforming the income variable, the relationship is reduced to somewhat a linear relationship where we can really establish that with higher income levels, it is associated with higher life expectancy across the countries, All right? So you will need to understand the reason why you have to take the log transformation. So not just the log, you can also take the square root as well. So by taking into consideration the same line of code, like take the, log, the common logarithmic transformation tool, and you will see that it's very similar to that of the natural logarithm. That's exactly the plot that we've had here. But what if I had taken the square root of income, for instance? If I had taken the square root of income, 
So we have the square root transformation as well. And what really happens? Hmm. I think the square root of income really did nothing, didn't do anything much to, to the relationship. But what if we are taking the square root of life expectancy instead? So when you are doing some of these, uh, that is why we call it uh, data exploration, all right? Because you are just trying to establish some kind of relationship between them. So we are taking the square root of life expectancy instead of the income, and let's see what is going to happen. All right, so by taking the square root two, we really do not find anything that was deemed so much important to us. So at the end of the day, we are just able to establish that there are some transformation. The logarithmic transformation was very helpful in establishing a linear relationship. So which indicates that the logarithmic transformation generally is normally used to transform a skewed distribution to, um, to a normal distribution, all right? So if you were observing that for only one of the variables, for instance, by taking the histogram of the gap minder data set and then the income variable, we notice that that is rice skewed. But then if we do the same thing for income, but this time around, we log transform income. Let us look at the distribution so far and see whether it is really helpful in normalizing this sort of data. So by running the histogram, good. You can see that it really approaches a normal distribution, even if it's entirely not normal. It is better than a skewed distribution. And so once you have logged your income, then you can go ahead and use your mean as a measure of center. But if you were working with the skewed data, then the median would be the robust uh, measure of center than the mean. Welcome everyone to the second part of the lecture series on introduction to data and statistics with R uh, so that we can bring this lesson to an end and hopefully tomorrow we'll begin our lessons on probability with R. So today's lesson, we now move on to categorical exploration and summaries. And so we are going to make use of the Titanic data set from the JD Mosaic package. And so the Titanic data set is simply the passengers and crew that were on board the Titanic ship before it sank. And so the variables contained in this data set are class, sex, age, and survived. And those are the categories right there on the screen. And so we will start with having one categorical variable, right? And so if you want to actually explore categorical variables, but it is one ca category, one categorical variable, then the kind of explorations you can do is to create a frequency distribution table, right? And also use a bar plot to look at their proportions yeah, in there. So if we should go to R and try to practice that out. So let me scroll down to where we have the exploring categorical variables and we are looking at one categorical variable and these are the two sort of explorations that you can make with that one categorical variable. So we have the frequency table and then we have the bar plot. So when it comes to the frequency table, the function to use in R is simply the table function. Now we also get a benefit of having explore a particular package that is also able to give very good frequency distribution tables. But let's start with the base R's function, which is the table function for a, a frequency distribution table. But before that, I think we need to bring in the data set. So let me scroll up to where we have the packages and if you don't have it installed, you use the function installed of packages and in double code, you just put in the GG mosaic. And then afterwards, you use the library function and then just call it in there. So I have it installed already. So I'll just go ahead and run this code, the library on the package, and then I will have loaded it in R. Now, one of the reasons why this package was chosen um, is that when it comes to two categorical variables, we'll just be creating a mosaic plot and it is 
it has a geometric layer in, uh, uh, with a DG plot functionality where we can use it to create that mosaic plot. Right. And inside of this particular package, we have the Titanic data set. There's also a Titanic data set in the base R, but it gives you some kind of um, an array, okay, which is not truly capturing what we really need. But then we'd like the one that is that happens to be in the DG Mosaic uh, package. So having loaded the package in memory, we'll go ahead and call it and call the data, the Titanic data into the environment window. So I will just use the data function and pass in the Titanic. So always remember that they are all in lowercase, all right? The letters are all in lowercase and that is the Titanic data set that we are looking at. If you look at the second one in, in the list that is displayed, we have the Titanic with the first letter in uppercase and that belongs to the data sets package, which is part of the base app, right? So this is not the one that we are importing into R, but we are using the one with all lowercase um, uh, letter, letters. So by filling that in and executing that line of code, we have the Titanic uh, data set called into R. And so we can just take a look at it by clicking on the name of the data frame in the environment window and then a nice table will pop up at where the street window is to see uh, what sort of column labels or variables we are dealing with. So you can see that all the columns are categorical in nature. We have the class, we have the sex, age, and then survived. So once the data has been imported, I will just go down there to our section and then create a frequency distribution table for, let's do it for all the columns. So sometimes if you want to know what columns are contained in a data frame, you can use the names function to do that. So you can go ahead and use the names function and pass in the name of the data frame. So if I put in the Titanic and then run that, I'm able to know that these are the column labels for the data frame, class, sex, age, and survived. So let me just append some notes here and say, displays the column names. So if I wanted to create a frequency distribution table for the class category, then I can go ahead and use the table function and then pass in the, the variable. But before that, I have to go through the data frame. So I'll just type Titanic, and then followed by the dollar symbol, and then select the class variable from that data frame, and then simply run it. Now the output looks kind of primitive yet informing, and you would notice that those that belong to the first class were 325, those belonging to the second class 285, the third class, and then the crew members were 885. So we can also explore um, the distribution of gender in there, we notice that in the Titanic, on the Titanic ship, there were 1,731 males and then 470 females. And then when we look at the age distribution, there were two categories of age, child and adult. And we got to realize that there were 2,092 adults and 109 children on board the ship. And then we also look at the frequency distribution table of those who survived. 1,490 people did not survive. And then 711 survived the sinking of the ship. So the frequency distribution table is used, um, is created using the table function. We also got to realize that we could use the bar plots for one categorical exploration. And so always when it comes to visualization, ggplot is the must go to function. So we just initiate our ggplot function and then we pass our data in there, which is simply Titanic. And then in the aesthetic function, we pass our variable. Um, so let's do that for, let's say, how, how many people survived and those that did not survive. So we'll just pass our survived variable to the x-axis and it will simply add a geometric layer 
Geom bar. And so if you run this line of code, we're able to get that distribution of those who survived and those who did not. And clearly we can see that those who did not survive were more than those who survived. So the bar plot is also there to do that for us. Now by copying down the same code, but this time around, instead of mapping the survive variable to the x-axis, we can also pass age to the x-axis and run it. And they will know that there were more adults than there were children on the ship. And then we could do the same for the class. And then we would also notice that there were more crew members working on the ship than passengers. And then for the last variable that we can also look at, uh, belonging to the gender, we would also see that there were more um, males than females on board the ship. Now, because we are dealing with this um, kind of exploration, I would like to um, take the kind of, let me call it a slight pain to take you through how to, for instance, um, label the, the proportion of the bars in percentages, right? So we want to display the percentage on top of each bus for the gender category. You can do it for any other category, but let's do that for the gender so we know how to do it. And so we need to just uh, rely on the tidyverse to do that for us. And so because we have gone through the tidyverse collection, the tidy and deep layer, then we can just go through and do this sort of thing. And so I will start off with the data frame, Titanic, and then I will chain using the pipe operator. I will chain, first of all, the group by verb. All right, so I think I have not loaded a tidyverse uh, package. So let me just go up there and it is right here. So highlight this line of code, library of the tidyverse, and then run it to load it in memory so that I can access all the functions or the verbs in the, in the dplyr app for this purpose. So once that is done, then I can go ahead and group by sex. And then call the summarize verb and look at the count. And so let's name the count as n and then use the n function to count how many males and females we have in this data frame. And so by running that line of code, we would see that for the males, there are 1,731, and for the females, there are 470. So that is the data frame right now. Then if I wanted to create another column, which contains the, the percentages, the proportions of males and females out of 100%, then I can chain again a mutate function. The mutate verb is used to create new columns or modify existing columns. And so with the mutate, I will go ahead and name it as prop for proportion. And I'll simply grab the column N and divide by the sum of N. And that would give us a proportion. So if I should run that entire line of code, then you can see that there are about 79% males and then 21% females on board the ship. And that is the entire data frame that we have now. And so if I want to go ahead and create the bar plot out of this data frame, you can actually save this one in an object. And perhaps you know that there are three columns, sex, N and then prop, but then I will chain the ggplot function directly. And so chain it again and then initiate my ggplot. Now in the ggplot, we usually go ahead and pass in the data, but because the data is the codes that are above, I'll just go ahead and ignore that. So ggplot, and then I will add the geometric layer called the geom bar. But we set forth our aesthetic attributes, X to sex, and then Y to the count. 
So x equals sex, y equals n. And if I should run this line of code, you will notice that it says it can only have an x or y aesthetic. So anytime we are creating a bar chart, probably it should take in one variable. But in order to override the fact that we need the cat categorical variable to be on, on the x-axis and then the count separately on the y-axis, then we will have to, outside the AES function, set the start argument to identity. And if you just wanted to avoid using the start equals identity, then you could use the geom call instead of the geom bar. So by setting the start equals identity, if I should run this entire line of code, you will notice that we're able to get our bar plot. And if I should copy the same lines of code, paste it here, remove the argument start equals identity, change the geom bar to geom call, like a column chart. And then if you run it, so let's assume that I am clearing the plot. So let me just go ahead and clear all the plots and then run that code as well to let you know that the June call will accept the X um, as mapped to the sex variable and then N as mapped to the Y aesthetic. And it will be able to get a bar plot as well. So that in the same data frame, we had the sex, we had the N, but what remains is, let me bring it to the console. We have the prop there. And so we are just going to add another layer called the geom text. And then we set forth an AES function. And inside there, we use the label argument equals the column that contains what we need to use for the labeling. And so for, my, for that matter, if I go ahead and set it equals to the prop, then I'm going to run it and see what is going to happen. So by running it, the June test also requires the following missing aesthetics. So I think what R is getting confused about is once you have set for the prop um, uh, variable to the label aesthetic, it needs to match it with what you need to use for the labeling. Does it match with the N and the male or the 470 and the female? And so for that matter, before the label, I will just go ahead and specify my X to be sex, my Y to be N, and the label equals the prop. So once I do that, just like I did in the Joom call, just that there is now another label equals prop inside of the, uh, the Joom test function. By running it, we're able to produce the bar chart with the proportions placed on top of the bars. But it has brought along all the decimal points, and so we have to round it to two decimal places. And so let me help you out by breaking this one to the next line. And then let me also go ahead and break the closing parenthesis for the geom text down so that we have the label equals prop right there. So I am going to place the prop variable inside of the round function and then set it to two decimal places. So round prop, then two decimal places. And if we should run this entire line of code again, then you notice that we have the two decimal places for the proportion. Now I would like to make this one in percentage. So I have to multiply by 100. And so I'll just simply multiply the rounded figure by 100. And then by running that again, you'll notice that we now have 79 and 21, but we are missing on something, the percentage symbol. And so remember that there is what we call a paste function. And the paste function will accept any number of arguments and then change them together as if it were one string. So like for instance, if I say 50 comma, and then it, as a character, I pass in the percentage and run this, you'll notice that it puts it together as a single character, 50%. But there happens to be a space in between. If that is what you want, you use the paste function. If you don't want that space, 
then all you have to do is to change the paste function to paste zero function. And once you do that, it removes any spacing in between the characters. So I think the one that we are supposed to use is the paste zero. So you know what we have to do? This whole thing right here in the geom tests uh, function is what results in the 79 and the 21. So that is the number we are referring to. But then if we should place these into the paste function, then it should be followed by a comma and then a character of the percentage symbol. And that will put it together for us. So let me cut that one out and then bring into the scene the paste zero function. And inside there, I paste that whole thing, then comma, and in as a character, I just pass in the percentage symbol. And if I should run this line of code, now we have our 79% and our 21%. And you can see that at the very edge of the top of the bars, the number happens to lie in the middle of that edge of of the lines on top of the bar. So we have to raise it up a little bit. And so we use another argument called the V just, which probably stands for vertical adjustment. And so if I should set it to, for instance, one, let's see what's gonna happen. You have to play with the numbers to see which one works for you. So by running that, wow, the one pushes it further down. And so I have to reduce it. So let's change it to 0.5. All right, up in the middle, right? Great, okay, so what about zero? All right, it's gone up as well. And if we feel it is just too close to the edge and we have to push it further up again, then we have to go into the negative. So negative 0. Point, let's make it three. Great, so that our numbers are just resting on top of the bars right now. And um, once I have done this, then what else do you need to do? Maybe if you want to increase the text size of the labeling, then you would have to add a theme function. So a theme, and with the theme, I am going to target the, the labeling, all right? The text. So what I'm going to do is, Hmm, let's find out and see. All right, so if I wanted to target the, the size and want, wanted to make it big, right, we have to still do it in the geom test function, okay? So for now, let me clear the theme. The theme will come in handy, but then let me clear the theme and then still inside of the of the geom test function, I will just have to pass the size. Let's make it twice the size and let's see what's gonna happen. All right, twice the size. So size equals two, yeah. So, you know, we have these aesthetic attributes. If you remember in ggplot, we have the we have the fill, we have color, we have size, we have shape, we have alpha, we have line style, so many aesthetics. So I, I nearly forgot that. So I knew that the size now should be passed into the geom test function instead of going to the theme. Uh, layer. So now we have these proportions. If you wanted to do anything in, um, concerning the colors, you can also go ahead and do it as well. So these are some of the things that we normally do when it comes to data visualization. So this is just to explore a single categorical variable. So let's go back to the slides. And then we are moving on to two categorical variables. And these are the various ways of exploring those categories. We have the contingency table, which is just simply what we call the cross tabulation. We have the stack back plot, the clustered back plot, and the mosaic plot. And so let's go back right into R and look at how these are implemented. So we start off with the contingency table. Now, after the contingency table, I'll show you the package that can be used to create very good frequency distribution tables. So we still end up using the table function, but this time around, we have two categorical variables. So let's say we wanted to know 
in terms of the children and the adults, those who survived, then I would have to use the table function and pass in the two categories. So I'll say Titanic, then the dollar sign, then I'm going to select the age, and then the Titanic data frame, the dollar sign, and I'm going to select the survived and run that. And you will notice that among those who survived, 57 were children, and then 654 were adults. But among the adults, 1,438 did not survive, and among the children, 52 did not survive. So let's do that also for how many males and females survived. So the table function, Titanic, and then dollar symbol, we select the sex, and then the Titanic, the dollar symbol again, and we select survived. And so by running that cross tabulation, we're able to decipher that 1,364 males did not survive, but 367 males survived. And then for the females, 126 did not survive, and about 344 survived. And so this is what we refer to as a contingency table. Now, having created the cross tabulation by passing into the table function two categorical variables, you know something? You can just go ahead and, for instance, chain the plot function to it. Just chain the plot function to it, and let's see what is going to happen. So once you run that code, we end up getting the mosaic plot. So that on the left-hand side, we have those who survived, yes and no. And then on the right-hand side at the top, we have the male and females. And so when it comes to, uh, by looking at the mosaic plot, we can see that there were a large chunk of males who did not survive, okay? Represented by this very big uh, kind of square over here. And then a few males actually survived. But when it comes to the females, we notice that more females survived than those who did not survive. So this is the mosaic plot from the base R perspective. But we'll be using the DD mosaic uh, package that we had loaded earlier from where we sourced the Titanic data frame. So let's say that by chaining the plot function, it created the mosaic plot for us in base R. And notice that if you didn't want to chain, then you have to grab this entire table with the two categorical variables passed in there and then place into the plot function if you wanted to also um, do that without the pipe operator. So you could have also done it this way, the plot function, and then inside there you pass in the table of the cross tabulation and run it and it'll still give you the same mosaic plot. And you can go ahead and use any other document that can label the headings and all of that. But this looks very primitive, okay? One common color. So we'll use that one from there. Okay, but before that, um, once we have also considered the contingency table, let's go up here. There is one package so far that is referred to as the summary tools package. So you would have to install it if you don't have it. So install the packages and in double code, you have the summary tools. Now I have it installed. So I'll go ahead and use the library function to load it, summary tools and run that. So once the summary tools package is loaded, you can go ahead and find out maybe what sort of functions are contained in this package. There are very few functions in this particular packet, but they are very good for uh, frequency distribution tables and all of that. And so I would just use the, uh, the question mark followed by the name of the package, summary tools, and perhaps I might get information about what uh, functions are contained in there. So you can see that the summary tools um, packet is a collection of functions which neatly and quickly summarize numerical and categorical data. And so data frame summaries are there, frequency tables are there, cross tabulations are there, as well as common descriptive univariate statistics that can be produced in a straightforward manner. 
All right. So users with little to no R programming experience, but who are familiar with popular commercial statistical software like SAS, SPSS, and Stata will feel right at home. And that is very true. Having explored this particular package, I was really much in love with it. And so um, the DF summary is also there to give you extensive yet legible data frame summaries. So this is one of the functions in there. We also have the FREC for producing frequency tables, supporting weights and displaying proportions of valid whatever. And we also have the DSCR, which will include all common unitary descriptive statistics. So this is what the descriptive statistics are about, DESCR. And then the C table for cross tabulations. And these are so far the functions that are contained in there, but they are very powerful. So just to demonstrate that for you, let me go down there and then create a section, um, let's say summary tools package. So let me write that lowercase because they are in lowercase. So summary tools package. So let me show you what a summary tools package can, can do. Um, if we wanted to run a summary of the data frame, um, which is the Titanic data frame, because they are all categorical in nature, all the variables, you can see that it gives you the proportion of um, the number of counts of the various categories in each column. So we notice that for the sex, there were 1,731 males and then 470 females and all of that. But what if we're using the DF summary function and then we pass in the name of the data frame, Titanic, and run it and let's see what's gonna happen. So by running that, you see what is already happening? Let me drag this window to the left like that, right? So it displays the variables in there and shows you the data type they, they belong to. So they are all factor data types. And remember we said I'll treat categorical variables as factor data types. And so it gives you the values or the categories contained in each class and then the frequencies of each one of them and some kind of a graph-like proportion showing you that, for instance, the crew members were more than the rest of the categories in the class variable. And then there were 2,201 uh, uh, observations, and so 100%, and there were no missing values. So you can see how it gives you a very rather comprehensive uh, summary than the base R summary function, right? So the summary tools package is one of these powerful packages for you to explore your data frame. And what if I wanted to use the empty cast data frame, for instance, summary of empty cast. All right, warning message, don't worry about it. So, yep, we do have the miles per gallon, the CYL, the DISP, and all those sort of things. And I think this, this one, it's a warning message, so that is not an error. So warning messages in error are not error. So. Uh, when they come just for more information about what you are doing but if you don't understand anything don't worry whatever you you requested out to do it did it did for you but one thing is that if you look at this variable for instance the vs it has to do with whether it, it is a v-shaped engine or a straight engine and it has only two values zero and one okay but as far as i recognizes it as at this point it is numeric and so for that matter it tries to give you the minimum maximum third quartile and those sort of things so i think maybe that is what accompanies the warning message or whatever but then if i had changed this one to a factor data type then you would have had how many zeros are in there and how many ones are in there okay so this is what the summary uh, can also do so let's say I wanted to do that for a single variable, empty cast, then let me select the miles per gallon. And then you notice that we have the minimum, the first quarter, the median, the mean, the third quarter, and the maximum values. But what if we're using the DF summary on that single variable? Then what really happens? So let's see what is gonna happen with the DF summary. Well, it gives you the mean as 20.1, it gives you the standard deviation as six, 
It gives you the minimum value 10.4, the median is 19.2, and the maximum is 33.9. The interquartile range is given to you as 7.4, and the coefficient of variation is 0 0.3. There are 25 distinct values in there, with 32 valid values, and then zero missing values, and a graph showing you the distribution of the variable. So if I had placed in it only the data frame, it would do that for each single variable consecutively. That is the power of the summary tools package right there. Now back to the Titanic data frame. If we wanted to create a frequency distribution table of the, of the sex variable, by running that, you can see how primitive the output looks like from the base uh, functions perspective. All right, so we have this right here. But what if I wanted to use the function from the summary tools package? Then I have to use the freq function. Okay, so in that case, I'm just going to grab the same code, but this time around, I will change the table to freq. And so when I run that, wonderful, 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 we have the number of males are 1,731 with 78.65% uh, of the proportion by gender. And then we have 470 uh, females representing 21.35%. And so they add up to 100%. The total values are actually given here. So they add the males and females, and then we get a total. And then the percentages also added up to 100%, and more other things like the percentage of valid cumulative uh, uh, values, and then percentage total, and those kind of things. And then it also brought out an NA, assuming there were NA values in, in the data frame, it would have given you the how many NA or missing values are in there, and then their percentage values. But because there were not any missing values, it's just all zero throughout. So that's the power of the frequency uh, function, the freq function from the summary tools package. And so, let me also grab this uh, code and then paste it right here where we created a cross tabulation, right? So by running this line of code, we get to realize that we have the, the age, child and adult on the left and then distributed between those who survived and those who did not. And so this is a cross tabulation that R is able to produce us uh, from the base uh, function table. But if I wanted to create a cross tabulation really from the summary tools package, then I have to use the C table function. So all I have to do is to grab this entire line of code as simple as it can be, and just bring the letter C to make it C table. Is it C table? Yes, it is. So C table and I pass in the two categories. And so if I run that, let's see what happens. Whoa. By running that, let's put this one up. It is a cross tabulation, age against survived variable. And so for the age, we have the child and adult, and for the survived, we have those who did not and those who did. And so for uh, the children, there were 52 who did not survive, representing 47.7%. And 57 children who survived, representing 52.3%, like that. And for the adults, there were 1,438 who did not survive, representing 68.7%. And then 654 um, um, adults who actually survived, representing 31.3%. So you can see how the summary tools package could be very powerful. And what else? The descriptive function. So D-E-S-C-R, univariate, okay? So let's say, for instance, we're using the D-E-S-C-R, and then we just simply pass in the single variable MPG from the empty CAS package. And so if I do that and I wanted to describe that variable and run that, Wow, you will notice that we have the mean standard deviation, the minimum, the first quartile, median, third quartile, the maximum value, the mean absolute deviation, interquartile range, the coefficient of variation, the skewness, standard error of skewness, ketosis, and the number of valid observations that we have. Okay, so you can see this gives you a very comprehensive 
descriptive statistics that you can produce for any research paper or any research work. So if I had described the entire data frame, empty cast, then wow, well, you'd see all the variables there. So let me drag this window to the far right. And then you will notice that uh, for each single variable in there, we have the mean up to ketosis and all of that, that information display for you. Very, very powerful package. So if I should have run the descriptive statistics on the Titanic data frame, which are all categorical variables, and let's see what that also produces for us. Now, if I do that, it says what? No numerical variables found in Titanic. So anytime you have a data frame that contains categorical variables and, and, and the numerical values, the DESCR <clears throat> will automatically sort the numerical variables out and give you the uh, descriptive statistics on that. Because if you look at that, it says it is all common univariate discrete statistics applied to a single vector or to all numerical vectors. So it does not give discrete statistics for um, categorical variables. So ha having explored what the summary tools package holds for us, then we can just go ahead and then go to the stack bar plot as a way of exploring two categorical variables. So with the stack bar plot, we start off with the bar plot itself. So for instance, I just want to look at, because we are looking at two variables, let's see how many males survived and how many males did not, how many females survived and those that did not. So I'm just going to start with the ggplot function and then pass in my data equals the Titanic. And with aesthetics, I'm going to pass in x equals the sex and then y equals survived. But before I pass in the y, maybe not to the y aesthetic, okay? Just the sex alone. Let's find out and see what's going to happen. So geom bar and then run that and we're able to get the bar plot that we created earlier. But this time around, if I wanted to create a stacked bar plot, then I want the height of the bars to be, um, uh, how do I call it, to be divided by the second category that I'm going to give it, like survived. So among the males, who are those that survived and those did not? And among the females, who did not? So in that case, we have to use the fail aesthetic. So let me break the June bar down here so I can have uh, some space for that. So fail equals the survived variable. So I'll use the fail argument, the fail aesthetic. And by running that, we're able to create a stacked bar chart, right? So we would know that when it comes to the males, there were more males who did not survive because according to the legend, the red color is associated with those who did not survive. So there were more males who did not survive than females. And usually that is attributed to the fact that ladies first in everything. So we need to make them survive for our sake. Now with a stack bar plot, we will just, having knowing how to create that stack bar plot, it is just one thing that we need to tweak in the ggplot function and we're able to get our clustered bar plot. And so all that we are trying to do is that we just have to uh, grab even the divisions of the bars into their separate um, standpoints. And so what I'm going to do right now is I will grab the same code that was used to produce the stack bar plot. But this time around, inside of the geom bar function, there is an argument called position, which I need to set to a character known as dot. And if I do that, I get the clustered bar plot. So the two bars for those who survive and those who did not are clustered around the male, and we also have two bars clustered around the female. So we have a clustered bar plot. And so we're able to see that the height of the bars for the males who did not survive seems to be much larger than that. 
other things like naming the title and subtitle and captioning and all those sort of things will be left to you. Choosing the colors and those kind of things will also be left to you. Okay, that is technically the GG plot um, as a full lesson or something like that. And then with the mosaic plot, we also need to use a geometric layer like the geom bar, geom histogram, geom density, and those sort of things. It, it is not, we do not have a Joom for the mosaic plot. And so that is why we needed to install the package called GG Mosaic in the very beginning. So this GG Mosaic contains the geometric layer called Joom um, Mosaic. And that is able to create that plot for us. So if I come down here, I'll just go ahead and start off with the GG plot function and then pass my Titanic data frame to the data argument. And then my aesthetics, X should be equal to sex. Hmm. If I made a Y equal survived, and then we'll, let's see if we are going to get some error and then deep bad what is going to happen. So geo mosaic. And if I should run this, hmm, the mapping must be created by AES. However, I'll specify the AES inside of the ggplot function. So what seems to be the problem? All right, so just like in ggplot, you can pass the aesthetic function inside the ggplot function, and you can also pass the aesthetic function inside of the geom layer. Why don't we grab the aesthetic and then place it into the geometric layer instead and run that and see? And by, run, by running that, it says that the, the stat mosaic must not be used because it uses a statistic layer as part of the layers of ggplot. Uh, we have a statistics layer that does certain things behind the scenes. Like if you are creating a geom histogram, it is the start bin uh, function there behind the scenes to generate all these sort of things for us. By saying that it must not be used with a Y aesthetic. Hmm. So why don't we change it to fail? So fill it by survived. And by running that, it says that the object sex is not found. All right, so there's one thing that is missing out. Now there is a function in R called the product function, which happens to be in the GG mosaic package, right? And so if you want to create a mosaic um, plot, then you need to, um, because it says from the label, it says that it is a wrapper for a list. So that must be wrapped around the variable, I suppose. So the product function must do something like that for us. So, Instead of just saying x equals sex, I'm just going to say the product wrap around the sex. And by running that, great, we now have our mosaic plot. Anytime you are not sure about something, you just have to seek out help from the documentation or any other source you can find it. So you'll notice that with this uh, mosaic plot, it is much more detailed than the base R's mosaic plot that we created. Where was it? Here, this is the base R's mosaic plot. And if you compare the two, you can see that there's so much difference, right? Yeah, so primitive, but this one is very colorful and then very informative as well. So we can see that a large part of the males, many males actually did not survive the, the sinking of the ship. All right, so let's go back to the slide. And then we've demonstrated all for these um, four visualization uh, techniques for exploring uh, categorical, two categorical variables. So the next one is when we're exploring categories with one numerical and one categorical, then you have to use a box plot. And so how do we also do this in R? The Titanic data frame contains only categorical variables. We don't have a numeric variable. The empty cast, on the other hand, contains all numeric. There are some that are categorical in nature, but they are not yet factor data types. 
So for instance, if I wanted to use the type of engine, which is the VS variable in the MT cast, which is part of the base R, the, uh, uh, it's a base R data frame. Then I will just go ahead and let's view the first six observations of the MT cast data frame so you know what I'm talking about. So we're just going to look at the distribution of miles per gallon as against the engine types. So zero for V-shaped engine and one for straight engine. So this one should be categorical in nature. And so if I should go ahead and check the class of data, the data type that this variable belongs to. So MT cast followed by the dollar symbol and I select the VS, then I notice that that is numeric in nature. So we need to convert it to a factor data type. So I'm going to grab the MT cast data frame the VS, and then as dot factor, and then I pass in the same variable right in there. So that by running that line of code and by running the class function on the variable again, we notice that it is no longer numeric, but a factor data type. So once it has retained this factor data type's nature, then I can go ahead and initiate my ggplot function passing my data equals the empty cast data frame where the VS is now categorical. The aesthetic, I'm going to pass my X to, to the categorical variable, so VS, and then my Y to MPG, the miles per gallon, and then simply add a geom box plot uh, layer. And by running that, we're able to get our box plot for exploring one numerical variable, which is miles per gallon, as against one categorical variable, which is the type of engine. So uh, you can see that there's the vehicles with the street engines, that is the one that has labeled as one, actually is able to cover more miles per gallon, right, on average, than the cars with V-shaped engines. So if you wanted to explore one numeric variable and one categorical variable, you can also use the box plot. And so that is it for the lesson on introduction to data and statistics with R. And so we um, thank you very much everyone for being part of this meeting. Uh, it is nice meeting you. If you have any question, then you can bring it on board for us to uh, look into it. But our next lesson is now going to be on the foundations of probability with R. And that is going to be a lecture that will be held tomorrow at the same time. Thank you.